Okay, good morning and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining and welcome all to the EU Japan webinar series on COVID-19. Today's topic is R&I, Research and Innovation to Fight COVID-19. I'm Osamu Kuni, Head of a Strategy Investment Impact Division, a global fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. I'm now on the top of the mountain, can you see, called Iger. I climbed to the peak of Iger this summer, and this is a view from the summit. I hope you can enjoy it. Today, I will moderate this webinar, and I'm so excited to have such prominent speakers from EU and Japan. Before we start, uh, I have housekeeping announcements. Uh, first, simultaneous interpretation is available between English and Japanese. You can choose your preferred language by clicking the button at the bottom of your screen. You can click on English or Japanese. If you choose off, you can listen to the original language for the speaker. I encourage the Japanese speakers to speak in Japanese. Uh, the majority of the audience are Japanese, but please allow me to talk in English to make this session move fast and smooth. Uh, you can pose questions on comments during the webinar whenever you wish to by using chat function, which you can also see at the bottom of your screen. I will try to take care of your questions, as many as possible, but please do understand we have limited time. And my name is uh, Kuni from the Global Fund. And uh, I'd like to make the uh, announcements. And uh, uh, these announcements are just what uh, he described in English uh, before uh, this. So uh, no translation will be provided because he will be exactly speaking these, uh, uh, talking about the same thing. ベビナーの開催中はいつでも質問やコメントをすることができます。ただし、時間の都合で全ての let's get started. Uh, so world experts of infectious diseases knew that some day in the future a new pathogen would emerge and human would suffer from its pandemic. We called it disease X, and now we have found it, COVID-19. We were sure of the surgeon's emergence, but many of us couldn't imagine such a large scale and magnitude as COVID. Almost 30 million cases and close to 1 million deaths have been reported so far. Today, we are going to present a very hot topic, research and innovation to fight against COVID-19. Uh, so first speaker is Dr. Maria Pilar Aguar Fernandez, head of unit health innovation at European Commission. Actually, European Commission it play a very important role in this COVID, fundraising and others. So she would uh, briefly explain that the Euro European Commission's contribution to research and innovation. Peter, over to you. Konnichiwa, Japan. Hello, good, good morning, Europe. So uh, thank you very much. Let me start by thanking the organizers and all the participants for allowing me to intervene in this very important event. Indeed, as you have mentioned, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected severely all countries and all the activities. And uh, it is true that the, when the coronavirus pandemic hit Europe, research and innovation was among the very first policy areas in Europe that could react. And we launched our first call for research proposals already in January 2020. After that, and since then, we have in the European Commission mobilize substantial funds for research within the current framework program, 
for seven years that we call Horizon 2020, over 620 million euro have been dedicated to research on diagnostics, to research on treatments and vaccines. But not only for those topics, we have also created opportunities uh, to strengthen the capacity to manufacture a solution, also to understand other parts of this pandemic, such as the behavioral and socioeconomic impacts. And also we have dedicated support for finding innovative digital health solutions like the apps and tracing apps. You will hear more details on some of the specific actions from my colleague, Dr. Pierre Mullin. Let me please uh, allow me to share with you one of the most important activities that I believe is of uh, great uh, interest for all of us. And this is something that it's called the European COVID-19 Data Platform. This, as part of the research infrastructure, provides an open and trusted environment where the researchers can store data, share data sets, and we uh, allow like this to understand, we allow scientists to understand uh, some of the fundamental questions for, about the virus. And I want to bring this to the attention to the Japanese researchers because I think this is a very important uh, resource that can be broadly used also by you, both to share data, but also to get information. Since uh, uh, the data protection approaches in Europe and in Japan are aligned, it is a very good opportunity to, as I said, to share data and bring closer both research communities. So please uh, be part of, uh, uh, of our community that are sharing data where already more than 70,000 researchers have uh, taken this opportunity. So I want also to say that indeed beyond the um, initiatives that have taken place in Europe, we and the European Commission have been very, very active at the global level. We have a very global uh, approach and we brought together a number of countries all over the world in the global coronavirus response and the global pledge for access to vaccines at, at not only for Europe, but also at the global level. We have dynamically cooperated with other research funders at Japan in initiatives like the CEPI, which is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, which is developing now as supporting development of vaccines, and also GLOPIDAR, which is a research collaboration for infectious diseases, because we strongly believe that results of research should benefit the world population and not only Europe. So in this period, we are sharing our uh, activities with the rest of the world, including Japan. In the months to come, in the years to come, research and innovation, uh, and this is a shared feeling with uh, Japan, will be one of the key elements at the center of the transformation of our society. The society of tomorrow needs research and innovation to be at the center uh, of, of the new uh, normality and the new uh, transform normality, not only for health, which is obvious, but also for socioeconomic reasons, for climate related reasons, for digital reasons. And so research and innovation, it's going to be an important part if we want to become a more fairer world, a resilient world, and a more prepared world for the future crisis, independently of their origin. So with this in mind, we are proposing to build the new European framework program for research and innovation. It is called Horizon Europe and it will span for the next coming seven years. And uh, we want to make sure that research and innovations that are going to happen in the future are the most impactful and most powerful tools that we have to boost the economies and the competitiveness at the global scale. The next week, we are organizing our annual event, the upcoming Research and Innovation Days are open, are virtual of course, and they're open for uh, the world. And it will give you, they will give you a very good opportunity to have more information on how the research and innovation of the future is going to be looking like in Europe. So I would really, really, I would warmly invite you all to be part of this unique moment. 
In particular, let me flag one of the sessions on the 24th of September, which is called Horizon and Moonshot around the same orbit with Tokyo, where Dr. Um, Akaishi and Dr. Hamaguchi will be part of other speakers. It will, in this session, we will explore together how to strengthen synergies and how to enhance the cooperation between EU and Japanese ecosystems in order to, common, uh, to, to face common uh, challenges together, such as pandemic or climate change or aging societies. So finally, I would like just to close my intervention by saying that I look very much forward to this interesting debate. Domo arigato gozaima. Thank you very much. Mary Pila, <clears throat> thank you so much. It's a really great information, and um, we really need to promote this EU Japan, uh, you know, partnership. Thank you so much. Thank okay, you. so next speaker is Professor Peter Piot. Everyone knows him very well, I think. He's a director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and he's an expert, and I can say master of viruses, but especially three viruses. I can say, namely Ebola, HIV, and COVID. Because he is a co-discoverer of Ebola fever, and he was executive director of UNAIDS, and now the special advisor to the president of European Union, and foremost, the survivor of COVID. So he's not just a researcher, <laughs> educationalist and professor, but also he really experienced that COVID, and he fighted COVID-19. He will show a big picture and the global perspective of uh, research and development of COVID vaccine, especially, and global and regional collaboration to accelerate it and its challenges and the future scope. Peter, over to you. Thank you very much, Usamu, and uh, Konishiwa. Uh, good morning. Uh, great to be on this panel, also with my uh, good friend, uh, the uh, Kurokawa Yoshi. Uh, with whom we've uh, done uh, quite a few things in Japan, uh, founding uh, GHIT, which is also about innovation and technology, and um, and also with, uh, you know, Wakita Sensei. Um, so very pleased to be here. And um, I'll speak here as special advisor on COVID. And can I have the next uh, slide to the uh, president of the European Commission? And, um, and I'm here also because I'm a strong believer in the power and the value of scientific collaboration. And I think with the, uh, the COVID-19 um, pandemic, one of the silver linings is that um, there is an unprecedented collaboration, uh, sharing of science, sharing of development, and uh, uh, huge investments in um, trying to develop uh, not only the tools to uh, to bring this epidemic to an end, but also, um, you know, uh, as we just heard, um, you know, for on the social science, the economics, because this is not just a public health crisis, it is really a societal crisis that unprecedented in peacetime in our modern history. Um, now, um, I'll concentrate on vaccines, but there are many other uh, uh, developments, of course, and, and research going on, but, um, um, vaccines are probably going to be essential to take it, us out of this epidemic, although by no means it's a silver bullet or a magic bullet. So uh, it, it is, and I'll come back to that, uh, they will contribute, but uh, um, you know, um, but in the meantime, we have many other measures that are necessary. And um, it's a huge effort, huge effort. Um, and uh, here you see uh, we there are, uh, depending on the estimate, but uh, well over 200 vaccine candidates in the pipeline. That doesn't mean that they're all 200 of the same type of uh, uh, potential, but uh, it illustrates uh, how uh, you know uh, how intense the effort is. Um, and there are um, several platforms, eight different platforms. In other words. There are classic ways of producing a, and developing a vaccine. Um, you can type, kind of uh, uh, make the, the, the virus uh, innocuous to inactivate it or attenuate it, etc. Uh, so there are classic ways of developing a vaccine. And then there are also uh, totally new um, approaches. And so of the platforms, some uh, have uh, made it to the market and vaccines are circulating. Others 
are completely new, like RNA and DNA vaccines, intellectually extremely appealing, um, but we'll have to see what they uh, give in, in, in practice. Um, and um, the, um, you know, when you look at where we are at the moment, so not only are there huge investments and the investments are uh, coming from big companies, small biotechs, uh, startups alike. Um, the U.S. is actually the, 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 the largest effort with the, uh, you know, coming out of so-called of BARDA and the, um, you know, a special program called uh, Operation Warp Speed. Um, and uh, they've already spent about, I think, 12 billion um, U.S. dollars in, in to uh, advance and accelerate the vaccine R&D. But also in Europe, uh, there's a lot of investments and uh, uh, at the global level is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, um, which was the first one to uh, fund um, you know, vaccine development already uh, the third week of, uh, of January. And uh, Japan is a co-founder of, uh, of CEPI. And uh, so I think you can put that also on the credit of, uh, of, Jap of Japan. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, the, um, yeah, I won't go into any detail, but just to illustrate uh, the number of companies and academic institutions that are there, uh, perhaps we can concentrate on the nine um, products that are in so-called phase three trials. The phase three trials is a, a human trial where one tries to find out whether a product protects, whether it protects from infection and also uh, collect further uh, safety um, data. And um, these are the products that, um, if they um, make it through the trials, are the most likely to be first on the, on the market um, and hopefully in 21, and I'll come back to that. But uh, suffice it to say that they're a bit everywhere. I mean, the, um, they're in, in, in Europe, of course, they're in, in, in China, they're in the US. Um, and, um, um, and Brazil, uh, and the trials are going on uh, in, in uh, uh, several parts of the world uh, where there is active um, uh, transmission. Can I have the next uh, slide, please? Um, now, um, the, there are, in addition to the um, vaccine development, and I should, I should say that normally um, developing a vaccine, bring it to the market, is a very long uh, enterprise. It takes usually between eight and 10 years, can even be longer. And the success rate from the first, you know, um, let's say ideas and in the, in the lab and evidence in small animals, for example, and bring something to the market is less than 10%. So it is uh, really a, a quite a challenge and we have to, uh, you know, accelerate all that, but without taking shortcuts. Um, and that is the, the, the big issue. Um, now, uh, we have also uh, a number of initiatives. Um, we, uh, we just heard, um, you know, that uh, how Europe is very active. And I would say that um, when you think here on the upper left side of the, uh, of the slide is a so-called ACT Accelerator that stands for Anti-COVAX Tools Accelerator. It's an initiative that was launched by President Ursula von der Leyen together with um, uh, you know, the World Health Organization and a number of um, uh, heads of state and government uh, uh, late uh, April um, led to a major fundraising initiative uh, that was led by the, uh, the EU and um, with generous contributions. And the aim is not only to um, accelerate the development, but also support manufacturing. And uh, so this is a, um, a, a really an important uh, um, initiative, but it has uh, three major pillars, vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. And uh, for vaccines, that's, uh, the, 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 the acronym is COVAX. And uh, the explicit goal is not only to develop it, but also to ensure global equitable access to uh, vaccines. In other words, it's not only for the countries that uh, have the means to pay for it, but also to make sure that it will be, um, you know, affordable in low-income countries. And uh, we're working very closely with the African Union and the Africa CDC for this. Next uh, slide, please. Um, 
No, um, the question is, will vaccines end the pandemic? Um, you know, there are always uh, five questions when it comes to vaccines. The first one, of course, is, will it work? Will it protect? And to what degree? Uh, you know, and uh, most experts think that a vaccine that protects about 50% of the time will be good enough for licensing. And the question is, will it be, uh, uh, you know, preventing infection? or only um, severe disease and mortality, as is the case, for example, with influenza vaccines. That, of course, would be very helpful, but wouldn't stop the epidemic. And another big question here for coronavirus-based uh, vaccines is, for how long will the protection last? Is it one year, two years, five years, lifelong? Who knows? Of course, personally, I hope that we get protective immunity forever, but that's uh, not yet uh, assured. Secondly, very important, will it be safe? Because we're injecting biological materials in healthy people. And we're talking here about not millions, but billions of people potentially. So we need to have absolute uh, assurance of safety uh, before it is launched and used at a, long, at a uh, large um, scale. Thirdly, will there be enough uh, uh, you know, uh, doses of it? So again, as I mentioned, this is a pandemic. And we are not talking about millions of doses or hundreds of millions, but billions. This has never been tried. And um, the manufacturing capacity is not there yet. But this is where uh, COVAX um, invests a lot in it, but also major companies and uh, will require also major international collaboration. And just to give you an idea, uh, there are not billions of uh, glass vials in the world to fill with the uh, the vaccines that we need. So the, it, it's not just a biological material, it's engineering, it's a, a management and just a, a cold chain. Fourth is then um, distribution and who will get it first because it's unlikely we have billions, we'll start with millions. Uh, this is a matter of intense debate and uh, I think uh, there also we should make sure that it's not just those who can afford to pay but uh, that it is something that makes sense from perspective of on the one hand uh, dealing with the epidemic, but also protecting those who are most vulnerable wherever they are. And finally, will people accept it? Um, there are, uh, you know, very big uh, issues with uh, vaccine confidence and acceptance, be it in Europe with several vaccines or in Japan, like say for uh, HPV vaccine. So we need to prepare for that also that people will actually uh, get it and that we have uh, you know equitable distribution but also that we prepare and there's vaccine confidence and final slide then i'll, I'll stop um can I have the next one so i i'm mentioning this that so that vaccines are uh, going to be absolutely essential um however uh, we need to start thinking of the long term when it comes to this epidemic the long term in terms of um you know, societies living with, um, with COVID-19 in some way or another. Uh, we'll have outbreaks and, and that's already starting, be it in Japan or in Europe. Um, so we need to make sure that we can contain them immediately because otherwise we'll go again to nationwide lockdowns and so on. And that's the last thing that our economies uh, can uh, afford to do and, and, and that people are, uh, will, you know, accept or uh, because they're suffering so much. Um, and, and this is where vaccines are uh, really going to, to play a role to minimize that. Um, I won't go over the whole um, uh, list, but this means that the research agenda should not only concentrate on the development of these products we desperately need, but also on other aspects. And um, from preparing for the next epidemic to have better governance. Uh, and this is something where no country alone can deal with it. Um, viruses are not uh, bound by borders, by visas, by passports, and uh, this is where international collaboration is extremely important. That's why I'm so uh, really pleased by a growing collaboration between Japan and, and Europe also in the uh, research and innovation space. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it is a really great uh, you know, overview. Okay, so next speaker is Dr. Takaji Wakita. He is a director general of National Institute of Infectious Disease. It is a you know leading uh, agency to fight against the COVID in Japan. So he will um, 
uh, explain that the needs of uh, R&D, research and development, uh, to fight the COVID in Japan and its progress and challenges. Dr. Wakita, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Kuni. Today, I would like to talk about R&D in Japan. I'm not the person to talk about the overview of R&D in Japan, but my institute is the representative institute for infectious diseases. Therefore, I'd like to talk about some R&D activities at our institute for the next 10 minutes or so. So, let's take a look at my presentation. There are three things I would like to cover. First, this is looking at the current situation in Japan. It's quite close to what is happening in Europe. We have experienced the first wave, and right now we are in the middle of the second wave. The first wave experienced a state of emergency and a stay-home request, and it subsided, but now we are experiencing the second wave. And although we didn't have a state of emergency declaration, but local governors' responses are working. We are now looking at um, over 70,000 uh, cases of infection and the deaths, uh, the number of uh, mortality uh, has risen to 1,400 or so. So at the beginning, our response was mainly cluster detection. Uh, of course, there, when there is a person with infection, we do contact tracing. What is very important is to find a source of infection. And uh, this is done by healthcare workers. So this is uh, very much a labor consuming or labor intensive work. Uh, so uh, contact uh, tracing apps uh, need to be developed. But in our institute, uh, we actually use the method called molecular epidemiological tracing, SARS-CoV-2, this genome has random mutation every two weeks. This is a single mutation. And based on this hypothesis, we decided to trace the virus. And that way, we thought we could identify the source of cluster. When there is a cluster, what is the source of that cluster? Even if the epidemiological link is missing, uh, molecular tracing is still possible. For instance, uh, you remember this back in uh, February, a cruise ship called Diamond Princess had a lot of uh, cases of infection. And this is a, a phylogenetic analysis. If you look at that, the pink represents a Diamond Princess uh, infectious cases. And then if you conduct a network analysis, this is Wuhan, a prototype case of infection and a single nucleotide variant uh, is being traced. One, two, three mutations are included and they were captured in that cruise ship. So um, that was the end of the infection at that time. But uh, when it comes to the first and the second waves, how has it spread? Let's take a look at that. First, this is the first wave. Uh, this uh, blue is uh, Europe. Uh, this is looking at the entire world. And then uh, this red is uh, Japan. And then we see a lot of uh, infectious cases in the first wave. And after that, the first wave uh, subsided with the declaration of emergency. But then there was just one strain. This is one strain that is connected to the second wave. So this one strain produced the second wave. So this is um, due to the single nucleotide, nucleotide variation. And we discovered this with this tracing. So the uh, strain that is uh, spreading uh, this virus has stemmed from just one strain. So we can actually identify uh, which strain and from which country this has come to spread the infection in Japan. And we have a geographic distribution, age distribution clusters, and also imported and domestic spread. And we analyze all of these aspects. What's very important for research and development is antiviral drug 
development. Uh, to develop a new antiviral drug, it takes a long time. Therefore, we'd like to utilize already approved drugs. Pharmaceutical companies in Japan getting together with the academia and a lot of libraries have been provided and we look at them biologically, biochemistry wise and in silico and mathematically and then those compounds are brought to the clinics. And the first, we, we look at the 300 approved drugs. Out of those 300, we identified five compounds and nerufinavir, this is for HIV, and cefaranthin, which is uh, for lower uh, white blood cell, they had very high IC90. And if you look at the uh, mode of action, um, safaranthine binds to ACE2 receptor and blocks the entry. And nerofinavir is a, a protease inhibitor. In HIV also, antiviral drug, by combining different mode of actions, you can prevent uh, resistance from happening and also the efficacy can be boosted. If you look at the synergistic antiviral effect between these two drugs uh, with the uh, concentration dependent manner, you can actually observe the synergistic effect. So there is a dose response effect. What's good about approved drugs is that we already know the pharmacokinetics because they were tested in clinical trials already. So we combine these two and then we can actually check the pharmacokinetics of the combination. And then the uh, pharmacokinetics and dynamics are already there. For instance, the viral replication occurs within the body and then afterwards it subsides. After the peak, uh, antiviral drug intervention does not actually work when it starts replicating because uh, likewise influenza it's very important to use the antiviral drug at the very early onset of the infection so with the early intervention you can get better efficacy so we already have a publication for this combination nerofinavir early intervention uh, whether there is good efficacy or not, we have a randomized controlled trial already in the clinical stage. And uh, I said combination of different mode of actions is very important. So nerofinavir, this is an oral drug and cefaranthin. Unfortunately, it's not an oral drug. Uh, we are now trying to replace it with an oral drug. We are trying to find a candidate drug. And by combining the two, we would like to come up with a better combination therapy. We have screened over 3,000 non-approved compounds in order to come up with better candidates. So we are also developing vaccines, but as Dr. Piot already told us, there are a lot of concerns still out there for vaccine development. Um, one thing is no vaccine is available for coronaviruses and we have to use BSL-3 and uh, there is low growth rate of the virus. But as we saw in SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV, disease enhancement depending on antibody and not just that. The uh, um, antiviral drug may worsen the disease. This is a disease enhancement. So inactivated vaccine and also virus spike protein based vaccine are being tested right now uh, for um, papilloma. This or approach already have a history, so it's not an entirely new approach. But for SARS vaccine development, inactivated virus was used for months and in activated together with alarm when you inoculate that disease enhancement was actually observed uh, eosinophilic infiltration worsened the state of the pneumonia so this is probably because of the uh, th1 th2 balance uh, more skewed to th2 this leads to disease enhancement therefore instead we use toll like receptor agonist that way we can get rid of the disease enhancement and good immunogenicity was observed. So I think we have to be careful with this aspect of vaccination. So just to summarize, R&D is very important to fight against COVID-19. This is, I'm sure, a consensus among all of us. And one way is to have viral genome epidemiology. 
This is a very important approach, and this is um, to support cluster surveillance. And another one is antiviral therapy development. A combination is the key. So, uh, drugs with different mode of actions to find those, and a good combination is the key. And yet another very important thing is antiviral intervention needs to come early on. So if infection already takes place and some time has elapsed, uh, the antiviral drug may not be as effective. And this is an uh, observation from a simulation. Vaccine development is accelerated across the world, but we have to check the efficacy as well as the safety of the vaccine. And the side effect monitoring is very important. And RNA and also viral vector uh, vaccine, these are all new platforms and new approaches. So we have to also secure the quality of such vaccine. Uh, this is a kind of perspective that should not be missed. That is all from me. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wakita, uh, for a very mixed uh, uh, presentation of uh, very comprehensive and also very specific, very, very informative. Thank you so much. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Pierre Mullen. Uh, he's an uh, executive director of Innovative uh, Medicine Initiative, IMI. Uh, this is a public-private partnership aiming to uh, speed up the development of better and safer medicines, this time therapeutics and diagnostics for COVID patients. Pierre, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cooney, and uh, very happy to be part of this, uh, this platform. Um, uh, thank you for the slides as well. If I could have the next slide. Um, just for those who uh, are, are not aware of the Innovative Medicines Initiative, it's a very significant public-private partnership uh, based in, in Europe, um, representing a long-term commitment from both the, um, the European Commission, uh, providing very significant uh, funding, and the European uh, pharmaceutical industry also um, supplying a very significant uh, resources in mostly in terms of uh, in-kind contribution, in terms of most of that is actually people from industry being integrated into large scale uh, projects. Um, so we're in uh, the actual, uh, the end of the second uh, phase of, of, of this uh, program. And uh, we've allocated most of that uh, that five billion uh, euro uh, over the past uh, decade and, and a little bit more, the past 12 years. Uh, uh, the next uh, slide, uh, I actually divide my talk into uh, two bits. The first one is how existing projects in the portfolio uh, can address some of the issues around uh, around COVID. Uh, and my, this, the second part will be on the uh, specific um, call that we uh, put out in March of, of this year uh, relative to diagnostics and therapeutics. But all, all um, as you can see on this slide, there are a number, and I'm not going to go into details uh, on all of these, um, but there are a number of existing projects that can contribute to um, the response to COVID, whether they be um, uh, in, in terms of networks that have been created, uh, clinical trial networks, for example, that have been created in Europe around the antimicrobial resistance that can be repurposed for COVID, uh, whether it be on data platforms uh, that can now be uh, looked at for um, uh, building real world evidence uh, in, in COVID. Uh, I could have the whole Ebola uh, program that Peter Piot was uh, a key part of uh, because a lot of the uh, learnings and uh, technology platforms that have been created uh, in the Ebola vaccine. Uh, that that uh, vaccine has given, been given authorization by the Euro Commission, European Commission for use very recently. And of course, that same technology is being used for uh, COVID uh, vaccines. I would, will point out uh, two uh, specifics though. Uh, next slide. Uh, and that is about uh, a project that's a five-year-old project called Zappi. It's about uh, zoonotic uh, diseases and uh, pandemic preparedness. And uh, one of the um, uh, uh, one of the uh, viruses that was chosen as a proof of concept for uh, building a platform on 
vaccine and monoclonal antibody uh, technologies was indeed MERS. Uh, and uh, they have developed a, a monoclonal antibody that's uh, against MERS, but that cross neutralizes uh, COVID-19. So or SARS-CoV-2, I should say. And so that uh, monoclonal antibody is now the, the topic of a European Commission funded uh, project in the program that Pilar was talking about called MANCO. And of course, we have a new project that I'll talk a little bit about called CARE, where there's a neutralizing antibody platform uh, technology part of, of that as well. Uh, and the second example I'll give, next slide, please. Uh, is on the um, uh, is on a technology uh, digital uh, platform called Eden, uh, uh, the European Health Data Evidence Network, and they have uh, repurposed a lot of their work for COVID, and indeed they have already published uh, papers. One which is the largest ever assessment of the safety of hydroxychloroquine, which, as you know, had been proposed for COVID-19 and the second one on the international characterization of COVID-19 patients. On the next slide then, uh, we now go to our own specific call for proposals, which was uh, um, uh, launched in, on March 4. Uh, this was uh, focused on therapeutics and diagnostics. Um, uh, it was uh, with a budget from the European Commission part of the of IMI, 72 million, and industry, industry contribution from selected projects has been a 45 million euro. So you can see quite a significant uh, program. We've ex uh, ex uh, excluded vaccines uh, explicitly from this. Uh, because, uh, as you saw from Peter's uh, presentation, uh, there is all, an awful lot of uh, activity in the vaccines and we certainly didn't want to increase the fragmentation of what was going on in the vaccine field and the European Commission was already uh, dedicating significant uh, resources into CEPI uh, and so on and so forth. So we received 140 uh, submissions, uh, which was a, a major evaluation challenge because, of course, we were in remote uh, operational mode so it was uh, quite interesting and we've selected eight projects for funding next slide please i'm not going to go through all of the projects but just to mention one in particular called care corona accelerated r d in europe uh, which is the largest project this is a 70 million euro project half coming from uh, the public funding and half coming from the private funding and very significantly for uh, this meeting, the lead um, uh, private sector uh, players here are Janssen in uh, Europe and Takeda, a Japanese uh, pharmaceutical company. And uh, they are leading the charge on this with uh, the public partners at Inserm in, in France. Uh, and it's going to be a very significant um, both repurposing uh, screening for new uh, therapeutics and, as I said before, the antibody, uh, monoclonal antibody uh, platform. There are other, um, uh, uh, there are other um, uh, uh, projects that are uh, very uh, interesting too. Uh, you can read about those on our, on our website if you're interested, uh, but do include some repurposing uh, uh, approaches. And next slide, uh, so there are several um, uh, diagnostic, uh, rapid diagnostic uh, projects that are, uh, have already um, uh, started. So we're, we, we haven't finished the, the, the grant agreement uh, phase for all of these, but um, uh, due to the uh, nature of the emergency, we uh, and our governing board agreed that we could reimburse eligible project costs that were incurred since um, the 1st of uh, April or after March 31st. So that um, although we, we know there's a lot of bureaucracy uh, involved in this, we, in, in this case, uh, we didn't want, certainly didn't want the bureaucracy to slow down the research against this uh, challenging um, uh, disease. So um, I, I, my next slide, I think I'm, I'm finished. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that uh, you understood that all of this is, uh, we're making huge attempts to connect this, all of this work uh, globally. Uh, we're part of the um, uh, Dlopidar um, uh, coordination uh, body. We're situated 
uh, upstream of initiatives like uh, like uh, the accelerator and uh, find uh, for the diagnostic uh, piece. We're very well connected with other funders like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust. Uh, we've had a lot of input from them um, and indeed um, funding from the, 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 the Gates Foundation for some of the, the projects. Uh, we need to do a lot of uh, joining up dots, I think, at a global level to ensure uh, that the best coordination uh, uh, possible is is done, and I think uh, that you've already heard from from Peter and from Pilar in terms of what the European Commission are, are doing in that uh, in in that vein. So thank you very much for your uh, attention, and uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Pierre. Actually, I am very much impressed with not just only uh, uh, your facilitation or acceleration of uh, diagnostics and therapeutics, but also uh, using your kind of existing um, the networking or kind of mechanisms, you're really kind of facilitating the research itself. You know, this uh, using existing IMI project to progress research. Actually, there are a lot of uh, very interesting and very helpful, you know, that uh, mechanisms you are making. I, I'm not sure, you know, the people in the world know these, uh, you know, kind of uh, initiative. Actually, some of them are not kind of well known to me. Maybe I'm, I'm not so much kind of uh, uh, aware of this, but uh, it is quite interesting. Maybe I want to ask uh, Dr. Wakita later that, uh, you know, after listening to um, the PL's uh, presentation, how, you know, Japan could have, uh, you know, more kind of collaboration with uh, EU and IMI, et cetera. Okay, so uh, final uh, speaker is um, Professor uh, Kiyoshi Kurokawa. He's also very well known in the world and the president of Health and uh, Global Policy Institute. And he's the chair, maybe currently you're chair of the government's Corona Committee initiated by uh, Minister Nishimura in charge of the Corona pandemic. I've seen that your blog, you just stopped talking because you are now kind of a chairperson of uh, you know, the government. You are usually very frankly talking, but uh, <laughs> so this time I really expect you to, you know, the candid talking about uh, this R&D. Over to you. Yes, um, yes, uh, I have some blogs in English as well, so please take a look. So first, uh, I, I like to frame uh, the challenge. I'd like to give perspective to the problem. The world is changing very rapidly. Uh, 30 years ago, the Cold War ended, the Berlin Wall came down. So from there on, uh, we have seen globalization. We couldn't hide anymore. The speed was so rapid. Thomas Friedman, world is flat. In the past 30 years, uh, we are seeing the emergence of new paradigms. And among OECD countries, Japan uh, has not increased its GDP in the past 30 years. And this has been a problem. I have been pointing that out. But uh, um, things are not moving. And Prime Minister Abe stepped down. We now have a new uh, Prime Minister. So I'd like to have an appointment with a new Prime Minister. Um, well, uh, in the past 25 years, uh, we are not really increasing our GDP. Prime Minister Abe did quite well, but then uh, we are very rapidly aging at the same time. Uh, I'm very much concerned about Japanese aging society, and 200% uh, is the sovereign debt of our GDP. So we have to have financial assistance against the background backdrop of the pandemic, but is it recoverable later on? I'm very much concerned about it. What I'm saying to the Prime Minister's office is that uh, um, we knew that uh, a flu is going to come, but then uh, we had SARS and we had MERS, and then um, it became global pandemic, and um, the, um, there is a policy problem, leadership problem. Well, everything is clear on the internet. This is a new paradigm. So, from your perspective, at the beginning, Japan's response in terms of uh, diagnosis, and we didn't have a lot of uh, 
death cases, but then uh, at the same time, we didn't have a lot of testing capacity for coronavirus. Why is it? We have to analyze it. We have to come up with appropriate recommendations because this is not the way to go about this coronavirus. This is my biggest concern, which is about the national governance concern. And we have 200% sovereign debt. What are we going to do with our financial situation? So these are quite unique issues to us here in Japan. So Japanese uh, establishment, it, establishment, the weakness which has been unable to change is now being revealed. That is my concern. When the coronavirus, corona pandemic is over, how are we going to recover our economy and to what extent? I'm very much concerned about it. Of course, uh, the immediate concern is about vaccine and also COVID-19 itself. But then, overall, I have a concern about the economy as well. So um, vaccine development is going on. And also, Dr. Kuni is taking initiative. And once a vaccine is available, what should be the priority of uh, vaccine administration? We probably need to have some kind of universal recommendation. Why don't you create such an opportunity for universal recommendation? We now have a new administration and uh, we don't want to have domestic priority. We need to have global priority. So Kunisan, together with uh, WHO, for instance, you can take an initiative and based on the academia input or NGO input, uh, you should come up with a good global recommendation for the prioritization of the vaccine administration. I think that should be one very important outcome of this meeting. For instance, as Peter said, GHIT uh, is a Japanese initiative, SEPI also, they are doing wonderful, great things. How can we benefit from those in Japan? I think we are tested and we have a very great opportunity in front of us. So with this uh, corona pandemic, our governance in Japan, as well as the prioritization in Japan, should be shaken up. So that is my point. Is that okay? Of course. And uh, thank you very much for provocative yeah, talk about that. Yeah, thank you so much. And very concise and succinct. Okay, so uh, uh, shall we have uh, uh, some so, of the questions? Mm. Uh, I got uh, several questions uh, in a chat box, so uh, I want to ask some of uh, the presenters uh, about this one. Okay, first, maybe can I ask uh, uh, Pilar? There is one question regarding that EU's uh, commitment and also EC's, uh, you know, whether EC or EU are going to increase the budget, uh, you know, you really kind of started the kind of initiative and you supported the Act A, this uh, Act Accelerator, also uh, uh, EC hosted that uh, uh, resource mobilization, uh, the meeting, and uh, really kind of making so much effort. But uh, what is the kind of scope of, uh, you know, resource mobilization further? Mm. Or you can add any other things as well. Maria? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I see the question from uh, Adam Matejovic. I think that mm. the question he's referring to is the global uh, budget for the next seven years for whole Europe. And right. he's mentioning that the proposal uh, was uh, bigger than what has been agreed at the end. I will make a, a reply to this comment and then I will also take on the, uh, the additional funding uh, in the future that you have mentioned. So, um, yes, uh, the proposal that was put forward by the Commission was uh, obviously uh, bigger than uh, the final agreement. The, maybe um, for those people that is not so used to uh, understand or is not so aware of how the uh, decisions are taken in uh, Europe, we, the European Commission, came with this proposal, which is the money that would be spent in everything, like agriculture, like in uh, um, structural funds to support structures and uh, uh, investment in all over Europe, like uh, um, research funding, like deployment of digital tools. So the overall proposal of the Commission was bigger. That was uh, at the final agreement. But then to this proposal, each of the 27 member states 
So the, the heads of government came together and decided that the final uh, budget should be 1.2 trillion, 1.8 trillion, uh, because at the end of the day is the countries that are contributing. So they came to this agreement thinking that that was the fair agreement in which all member states, all European countries will have a piece uh, to contribute to. So this is how the budget was done. And uh, the, uh, uh, it's at the end of the day, the heads of each of the uh, states that come to this common agreement and they found that there was a lot of balance and the final sum was slightly different. But having said that, there are these additional funds that are now also dedicated to specifically to the what we call recovery package, linking to what Dr. Kurokawa, uh, Kurokawa just mentioned. It is um, health and COVID had to be also seen in the broader context of aging population and recovery from uh, for our society, which has suffered in a lot of manners, socioeconomical recovery, it's going to be uh, an, an issue for every country in this world. And uh, it is not going to be easy. So we have to, in a way, uh, the maximum dedication that we can give to these is to support the citizens, to support the companies, to support the economy at the, at the European mm -hmm. level, also the global level to, let's say, get back. It's not only our health that we have to recover, but also we are economies we have to recover. So right. that is the general point. And uh, to your question, uh, Dr. Cooney, it is uh, our commitment to develop vaccines and uh, other uh, type of action will continue in the future. The European Union recently joined COVAX, uh, which is uh, and has been a big promoter, as it was mentioned by uh, Professor Piot, a big supporter of the global response and a big uh, actor in the ACT facilitator. So we do agree that vaccines are, I mean, that the diseases do not know boundaries or uh, they do not know uh, frontiers. And just by benefiting our, uh, we would be, is in Europe's best interest also to make sure that this is a pandemic is tackled at the global level, as is also the case with Japan, right. because you have been distributing, you have been supporting this. Right. So indeed, we will continue to support COVAX and ACT uh, facility accelerator, not only for vaccines, but we are also doing that for um, funding new uh, drugs, new treatments, as you have seen, I explained by Pierre, my, my colleague Pierre Moulin, but also on the diagnostic side, because until the moment we have a uh, um, vaccine or an effective treatment, it is obvious that diagnostics are here and they are the, our best weapon to understand and to try to control uh, the spread of the pandemics. So we are very aware also of the value and the importance of uh, testing and diagnostics and, and we're also putting efforts into that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, there are several questions to Peter and even Rakita and others. Uh, Peter, maybe you can read, but the, one of the question is, um, kind of uh, prioritizes, maybe it is related to uh, uh, Dr. Krokauer's uh, also uh, uh, question. Uh, who are the kind of target uh, populations for vaccines if the you know, volume is limited? And I also, uh, you know, thinking how to just, you know, uh, match between uh, result of the, you know, trials, efficacy by age, and also what that kind of targeting of the uh, populations especially that kind of, you know, this uh, delivery. Of course, you know, the WHO is now, um, you know, discussing that uh, who would be a kind of priority uh, target populations and et cetera. But um, maybe I want to get uh, some input from uh, Peter. Over to you. Uh, thanks, yes. Thanks, uh, Samu. And um, um, yeah, this is now the, the next big question and, and uh, uh, hoping that there will be vaccines. There is also obviously a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, debate and posturing and so on when the vaccines will become available. I think sometimes it's a, a mixture of medical hubris and, uh, and political, uh, you know, agendas more than uh, what is uh, going to be realistic. As 
as we all said that um, you know we uh, we can't take shortcuts uh, as uh, Dr. Kita also saw shortcuts in terms of efficacy but certainly also not safety and these things take time that's the way it is um, so we are um, you know and there's a big difference between having results of a trial uh, even a phase three trial and then um, making the vaccine available so just uh, all on that so we um, I think we're talking really more about 2021 than about uh, the, the next few months uh, when it comes. But it's good to be prepared. And um, um, yes, indeed, uh, the World Health Organization has uh, already uh, issued some uh, recommendations, provisional ones, and many countries have their uh, national committee on immunization or whatever the equivalent is, have been uh, talking about it also in, in Europe. It's the European Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is really uh, our lead in terms of analysis and recommendations. So, um, and it is both a technical issue uh, and uh, a uh, you know and a political one, and uh, depends also where you want to start. But let's say the the one thing that is where I see consensus everywhere, not consensus, unanimity, um, is really that. Uh, healthcare workers and those who are working in care homes for the elderly, that they would be like the first ones to, uh, to be protected because um, epidemics often expose the fault lines in societies, they exacerbate um, inequalities. And one of these uh, fault lines, certainly in Western societies has been how we treat the elderly. Um, you know, we often park them in, uh, you know, in, in homes for the elderly and then let them, you know, waiting to die. So, I mean, I, I totally agree with what Kiyoshi said that that's one of the biggest issues. And, and there we can learn a lot from Japan because you've been the first ones to have this uh, ultra aging population. I just read that, that how many centenarians you have or whatever you say in, in English, uh, you know, is the world record. Um, and um, so the, then the next question is, um, you know, what comes after that? Is it the most vulnerable populations? And then we talk about elderly people. But here, one of the big um, technical questions is, are the vaccines going to be as effective in the elderly as in younger adults or in, in children? Because we know from quite a few vaccines that the protection uh, offered in people over 70 and certainly 80 is not as high as uh, for other adults. And that we know that, for example, from influenza vaccine. And uh, so that's why we need absolutely trials that address that. Maybe we need a, a bigger dose or, uh, you know, or two different vaccines that are being given, etc. cetera. So, uh, but that's uh, obviously a population, uh, you know, the elderly people with underlying conditions. In some countries, like in the UK or in the US, it's been shown that ethnic minorities, you know, particularly people of black and uh, Asian origin are much higher risk, should they come uh, as a priority. Then there's another position <clears throat> and that says we need to use this vaccine to stop the epidemic. And then you could argue it may be younger people who have to come first. So there is, uh, that debate is, is going on and um, I, I hope that uh, at least in Europe we will come to, let's say, a harmonized um, position because uh, otherwise, uh, this could give rise to a lot of um, yeah, political and uh, populist type of, uh, of arguments. Besides the fact that, let's not forget that, according to uh, research all, all over the world, that in some countries, up to 50% of people have said that they will not accept a vaccine. They will not take this vaccine. Uh, and when you take Europe, we are so diverse, you know. When you look at Japan, we are all the same, but we are not. You know, and then in some countries, the 50% uh, are going to refuse. In others, it's only 15%, percent one five. Um, so that's something we need to work on also. And, and that's where, why another reason that it's so important that we don't take shortcuts, that the whole process is very, very uh, with high integrity, um, that uh, there is a trust and confidence in the... Um, regulatory affairs and I was quite pleased by the fact the statement by the CEOs of um, I can't remember of how many companies the big vaccine manufacturers that they say they will not uh, accept uh, shortcuts and political 
uh, you know, interference there, but we'll see what the reality is going to be. Um, so it, a long answer to say, there are certain things where there is consensus, but then it's going to be uh, quite a, a challenge because the reality is in the beginning, we'll have to make tough choices. On the other hand, I think that uh, with a vaccine, we can, is the best guarantee to uh, go back to a bit of normality in terms of uh, travel and so on. There will be vaccine certificates. We have to make sure that there isn't a parallel market that uh, uh, starts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we, um, so it's not uh, finished. And and another issue is, and that's more on the R and D side, is that um, I, in general it's unlikely that the first generation of vaccines are going to be the optimal ones that we may go need for a second generation and so on and, and learning on what we have. So we're, uh, you know, we're gone for quite a, several years, both in terms of uh, research and innovation, but also uh, in terms of uh, implementation. Um, and one of the um, principles of the uh, EU supported, you know, advanced market commitments and uh, also the efforts of COVAX is that, um, this is, these are not only negotiations for uh, vaccines for uh, European citizens, but also there is a certain percentage, 20-25% that, um, you know, should be allocated for, uh, you know, low income countries. Uh, and in, in, in the case of Europe, uh, Africa is our kind of uh, the closest of there. And, um, and I think that this, I'm very proud of that because it shows that, uh, again, how let's use that old-fashioned word, but international solidarity is really uh, a very important uh, issue. And, uh, and that's again where Japan um, has been really active um, with Africa policy and, uh, and so on. So, um, so I'm, I'm, I think that's where the Japan and Europe can come together also in that kind of, uh, of approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there are other questions to Peter, but maybe later I will ask. So next, maybe Dr. Uh, Wakita, maybe you have <laughs> several questions here, so you can respond. One of them are uh, regarding, maybe this quite difficult uh, question, but uh, uh, by mutation, whether the efficacy uh, of vaccine could be changed. Uh, I see, okay. So we are looking at the viral mutations. We are closely monitoring the viral mutations and analyzing them. And uh, whether there is a mutation which has uh, something to do with the infection, we are monitoring it. D614G, this is a very well-known mutation. Uh, this is uh, already a major strain across the world. And spike mutation, when there is a spike mutation, the infectiousness or the nature of infection changes, that is already known. Whether this affects the efficacy of vaccine or not, there is no evidence as of now. Neutralizing antibody can be measured, so it is effective. But uh, there are certain concerning mutations out there. We know that already. And when those mutations become majority, uh, deletion mutants are there already for spikes. And when they become major dominant strains, uh, those uh, vaccines that are under development may not work for those mutants. So we have to analyze that in the future. And apart from that, uh, talking about the vaccine policy in Japan, we have an expert meeting in which we discussed the vaccine policy. We have uh, quite a, a heated discussion there. And first and foremost, to what extent the vaccine is efficacious, effective? That is a very important question. Could it really prevent infection or is it just preventing um, uh, severity of uh, the infection or is it uh, going to prevent the transmission of the infection? Unless we know that, this is a very difficult problem. But of course the priority is on the elderly and also on the healthcare professionals. We are already in consensus. But if the vaccine can prevent only severity 
of the infection. What is known is that uh, young people, they don't develop severe symptoms and RNA-based uh, viral vector vaccines. Uh, these are quite new platforms, so we have to secure safety of this uh, vaccine. And what about side effects? We have to look at that as well. And uh, um, just to prevent the severity of symptoms, would young people take such vaccine? That can be a problem. And because of the experience of papilloma vaccine here in Japan, here in Japan, we are very sensitive about side effects. Uh, we have the population of over 100 million and if vaccination takes place across the entire nation we may see emergence of um, a variety of side effects and how our people will respond to that so we have to be very careful with that so that's been discussed in the committee as well and as the vaccine is being developed and uh, somebody talked about COVAX initiative and of course uh, uh, we should not enclose the uh, vaccine just to ourselves. Uh, we have to make contribution as a country so that the vaccine becomes available for developing countries as well. This is another discussion point. There is another question to me that is um, why is it that uh, what I presented is not introduced by the government of Japan. We have task force under the government and I'm actually talking about uh, such initiative as I introduced today, but that's not well communicated to the people of Japan. So that is um, well, probably because of the risk communication that requires further enhancement in this country. Um, it said that Japan is behind in vaccine development. Why Japan is behind <laughs> compared to the other leading countries. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Well, uh, for emerging and re-emerging uh, infections, we have AMED led. AMED is a funding um, agency. AMED led research projects, but different from the US, we do not have BAUDA as an organization. We are not very advanced in that regard. So SARS and MERS vaccination development, we have some research projects for that, but uh, we didn't have um, collaboration with uh, vaccine manufacturers to truly develop or commercialize uh, such a potential vaccine. So we were behind since then already. But we are trying to catch up now. And there's just one compound that is in phase one here in Japan, but our vaccine is going to go into the clinic stage before the end of this year. And we are working together with vaccine manufacturers here in Japan in order to catch up. This is a big learning for us here in Japan. This is a lesson for us. We had SARS, MERS, um, but they didn't really infiltrate our society in Japan. And therefore, we were not vigilant enough in terms of um, emerging or re-emerging uh, infectious diseases, especially emerging infectious diseases. Therefore, we need to have an approach that is taken by, for instance, Bauda in the US. Kurokawa, please bring uh, uh, Wakita's voice to the um, cabinet. <laughs> okay, so uh, next one is uh, uh, PL. One question to you um, as for real inhibition of COVID 19. Although we have a bioassay data about uh, envelope proteins binding against human receptor, uh, ACE2, by using biomedical plasma nanotechnology, is there a chance to challenge the IMI project? It's a bit kind of a <laughs> professional kind of uh, a question. But. Okay, I'm not sure I'm competent enough to uh, answer this question, but indeed one of the one of the projects uh, has as a goal to look at the uh, uh, human cell lines and, and using uh, the ACE2 uh, receptor as um, uh, an, a part of uh, looking at, at assays for developing new new intervention, new inhibitors, and and so on and so forth. So. I'm sure a lot of the research at that level can be challenged uh, in in many many aspects, and um, uh, you know I I think uh, 
once again, we could um, uh, imagine that we could have some collaboration with uh, Japanese researchers. I'm sure there are a lot of uh, excellent uh, researchers who could uh, who could be part of um, these initiatives. So um, I look forward to uh, talking about that. Thank you, Pierre. Other question is quite related to variety of uh, speakers. Uh, you know, especially maybe to Dr. Wakita. Uh, e H D E N Aiden. Uh, this um, I M I that Kiel mentioned that it is a platform very very interesting, maybe useful, and also good uh, data protection. And uh, maybe Japan has a good data protection kind of agreement. I I, I don't know with uh, EU. So why don't you use uh, this platform? I also maybe want to ask uh, uh, maybe someone maybe uh, Peter or someone. Thank you. So about Aiden platform, actually I'm not uh, fully aware of it, but here in Japan, uh, Tohoku University Biobank initiative is there and the scientists are looking at data and samples data share is possible, data and samples are available for scientists. And for COVID-19, we would like to expand that initiative. We are working with uh, Tokyo University, Tohoku University, and our institution and medical center together. And COVID-19 patients registry and also samples, um, they will become available with the biobank approach. Because it's a biobank, uh, this is going to be an open data source. So this is a kind of initiative we are going to promote. Yes, this is a platform that can be shared with Europeans too. And uh, it would be wonderful if we can uh, come to an agreement uh, on partnership uh, there. That's what I can say about that. Really accelerate the kind of innovation of data, uh, especially you know the lot of uh, civic tech tech really supported uh, you know the developing um, that uh, uh, for example dashboard by uh, Johns Hopkins and uh, you know a uh, lot of things. So uh, really COVID really kind of accelerated the kind of a collaboration between you know public and private and even to a university and others and uh, uh, using open source, open data, and civic tech for progressing those, you know, data sharing, analysis, and synthesis. So uh, uh, what, what do you think about that? And how to facilitate those in Japan? Because um, I, I must say maybe quite conservative, you know, in Japan. So uh, we need to show even, you know, data are not kind of open source or open data, even showing either kind of a paper. So, uh, you know, sometimes uh, foreigners couldn't use and access to that. So I want to have comment. Please unmute. Please unmute. Dr. Krukova, I cannot listen. Unmute. Yes, yeah. okay now. Okay. Because we are facing a global pandemic, and that is why we are accelerating the collaboration within the country and beyond the uh, national borders. It's very important that we all work together, and uh, we are emphasizing that, that the, we are working with the Sony's Computer Science Lab, and uh, we have been working on the uh, possible proposals that we can input, and we'd like to get the uh, input uh, from the European side too. That's about it. And I was worried that the uh, maybe I will I will be appointed to the uh, uh, minister in charge of the IT. Yes, um, about the open source and open data in creating the registry of the COVID nineteen. The uh, you know and we have to ask the uh, doctors in the hospitals uh, to input the data to begin with. So. So the question of the uh, who owns the data, uh, that was um, the uh, subject of the discussion sometime, but I think uh, it should be uh, open data, otherwise we cannot um, advance our research. So it may take some more time, but the, uh, this is a general direction that we are taking. Okay, thank you very much.
So I want to ask uh, Pierre or uh, Pilar, because um, EU is a very much advanced in terms of a privacy, protection of privacy. As you see, you know, the Korea and the other countries uh, have a very good, you know, IT uh, system for tracing, isolation, etc. But uh, there is a kind of issue of, uh, you know, data <laughs> privacy. So, uh, but, you know, EU has a very strict uh, kind of regulation on that one. So how you could uh, kind of cope with, you know, that this balance between you know, real kind of a programmatic use of IT and uh, data privacy. Pierre, maybe you can first tell us. Well, um, I, I, I know that uh, the GDPR uh, legislation in Europe is indeed yeah. very advanced in terms of the levels of protection of personal data. Um, but this has, uh, this has uh, not been neutral in terms of its impact on on uh, clinical uh, re and biomedical research, and we uh, sometimes struggle with um, in our in our pan-European uh, projects uh, exactly how to uh, how to manage all of this. So it's not it's not as if we've solved all the all of the problems. I think the legislation is good, uh, but from a research perspective, I don't think we've solved all of the uh, 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 of the issues. Having said that, we have some very large scale projects that uh, are right now addressing those. Uh, and, th and this deals with um, the personal data that needs to cross institutions, that needs to cross jurisdictions. Uh, and, um, uh, and there's a realization that we probably need some exceptions to some of the legislation in order for us to progress uh, correctly with um, with this issue, uh, but we have uh, Eden is one of them. We have another project called Harmony, which is to do with um, uh, oncology, hematological uh, malignancies, and trying to harmonise good clinical practice on those mm -hmm. across Europe. And these are the projects where uh, they're at the core uh, and the heart of this uh, of this issue in uh, solving those problems. Right. Thank you very much. Can I ask a similar question to Maria uh, Pillar? Um, how to facilitate and promote IT, uh, you know, technology to advance this COVID, you know, kind of tools uh, to fight against COVID by uh, protecting personal data and other data? Thank you. It is indeed the um data protection, personal data protection, uh, it's a very big uh, um, commitment uh, on the European side. I also wanted to mention and to refer to something that I think it was uh, Dr. Kurokawa who mentioned that, or, or even you, there's a question on open data. We have been committed to share resources on data from our research projects since a long time. Open data has been the mainstream way that we operate in Europe and we are uh, constantly um, reminding that uh, as an obligation to our researchers because we believe that by sharing data it is not against us, it's on our favour. We make better use of these research data when they are open source. And in this respect, one of our first and major activities on against COVID-19 was this open data sharing platform that is already in place, is very, uh, very well advanced and there is a lot of different data in there, including uh, personal data. Indeed, one of the big advantages of cooperating strongly and, and closely to, with Japan is that we see data protection in a very similar manner. Our GDPR, so our legislation, our environment right. uh, framework is very, very close to a Japanese way of addressing and, and caring about the data. So I think that this is, represents a major advantage for both sides of, of this uh, uh, potential cooperation. And I think that by operating in this manner and bringing these values into research, we hope also that this is going to be expanded because it is important that our data are uh, shared in a, um, manner, in a manner that it's compliant with this legislation. I think that we 
in both sides uh, of, of, the, of the ocean, if I may say so, have uh, overcome some difficulties. Not all the work is done. It is difficult. We know that it's difficult to share data in a compliant way, but it can be done. We have a lot of research ongoing on this, not only for COVID, but also in other areas. And we are also very much committed uh, to what we call, and the, uh, our president von der Leyen mentioned it yesterday, to European health data space, where all the Europeans can share the data in a manner which is really uh, sensible, that is close to what the legislation says, complies with the legislation, and at the same time their data are free to circulate with, a, with the control, in a controlled manner. The data owner will always have the control of the data, that is important to say. It is obvious that it is not as easy as it was before to share data, but it's possible and we should really come to this opportunity to do things right. Facilitate as much as possible sharing the data, but doing that in a manner that is really complying with our views on how the data are handled. And I think this is possible between us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have another one minute. Uh, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are several questions reg regarding kind of a polit uh, political kind of a you know, influence on this uh, vaccine. So I, finally, I want to get uh, uh, some uh, input from uh, uh, Peter. I also want to just explain that COVAX is uh, one of the pillar that um, belong to the, uh, the vaccine. Actually, you know, Global Fund is also uh, uh, co-hosting that uh, diagnostic pillar. And uh, usually we have a kind of investment case Actually, my team is doing this investment case, how much, okay, what kind of needs and how much uh, each country needs. And we also make a kind of allocation, which countries we need to allocate that the, which kind of, uh, what volume of uh, vaccines or PPE, et cetera. So we have variety of kind of, uh, you know, the planning now, uh, almost kind of done that investment case and allocation. But the political you know, influence is a kind of big issue. It is very much politicized. That is why we need, uh, you know, global efforts. So, Peter, maybe final words you can give. Yeah, thank you for the simple question and uh, in one minute. So, uh, um, no, first of all, of course, it is political. There's no doubt about it because it's about the future of um, entire economies, as Dr. Kurokawa said, but uh, uh, the lives of many citizens and so that's uh, it's 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 normal. Um, but again, I'd like to stress that um, uh, when it comes to vaccines, because uh, the question was about that, um, that's where there is the biggest pressure that um, no company would be foolish enough to, uh, you know, to accept this kind of interference and to uh, cut uh, short uh, procedures and so on, because the, um, the damage to uh, that company, but to the country and to the whole vaccine effort may be enormous. Um, right. and, and I'd like to come back also to the fact that there is a lot of skepticism about vaccines. And I think like Operation uh, Warp Speed doesn't help when, the, when it's all about, well, the, the, the world itself, but then, you know, it's all about speed and so on. And then people think that, uh, uh, you know, this is all about money and the control of the government. So that's why I thought the statement by the CEOs of these companies was really very powerful. Mm -hmm. But we need to mm -hmm. make sure that that's also the position of uh, smaller uh, companies. Um, but that's why I think this multilateral approach is so vital. If we go for pure what are called vaccine nationalism, I think we will all lose. You know, there is some interesting game theory that you can apply to that. And we will all lose also because mm -hmm. there are so few countries that are actually manufacturing vaccines, uh, even some high income countries, even the UK, for example, does not produce, uh, you know, vaccines or hardly any uh, manufacture. Um, Japan is also in a bit of a similar vulnerable position. Um, mm -hmm. So we need this where um, I think this COVAX is important and COVAX is just an arm is a pillar of this act accelerator, but dealing with vaccines, but also is, uh, you know, as engaged and uh, groups like Gavi and CEPI and but many others uh, and the whole of the EU to uh, 
to negotiate and to make sure there is some fair uh, distribution of, um, of uh, vaccines. But, and I think in the end it will be okay, but it's going to be tough in the beginning. And if it's only, you know, if all the, the, the rhetoric is vaccines for our people and our country first, uh, I, I think we are all going to suffer. So that's why we, uh, it's so important and grateful that where Japan and the EU are like-minded and, uh, you know, and working so closely together uh, on issues like uh, COVAX, but also in other, uh, on other platforms. Um, it's the, there is, um, how to say, the, the paradox here is that if you um, put your own citizen first, which is what every politician should do, but if you only think of your own country, then you will lose. So you right. need to really bring in the rest. And that's yeah. very hard to understand in the world where populism is often the driving force um, mm -hmm. for uh, political decisions in many countries these days, unfortunately. Right. Thank you very much and great right. to be on the panel. And I think we need to, con to continue this conversation because there's an enormous potential for working together. Thank you very much. Right. Eh? And thank you, Osama, for bringing us thank together. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Very good uh, wrapping up. Actually, we need uh, another two hours to discuss, but uh, we have to close. Okay. But this is not the end of, uh, you know, story. It is a kind of a start of, uh, you know, our discussion and also uh, EU-Japan uh, kind of partnership. Because this is, this webinar series are uh, organized by EU and Japan and under EU-Japan political agreement. So we will need to link to, you know, the kind of future work. And uh, this time we really kind of got the very good information. Uh, you know, I really uh, expect Peter, Maria, you also, you know, the support uh, that global collaboration and even, you know, connection between Japan and the EU. So please facilitate. Pierre, uh, actually you really showed that the very good um, you know, networking and a very innovative uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, contribution. So uh, uh, I really want to link between uh, uh, Dr. Wakita and uh, Pierre, and uh, please uh, work on this and uh, please make a better kind of collaboration. And uh, uh, I want to ask uh, Dr. Krukawa to bring all kind of voices to cabinet, <laughs> next cabinet, and uh, please make a real action. I want to, you know, see real right. action, not just only discussion in Japan. and. Um, uh, you know, Japan has a very good potential, but a bit kind of, uh, you know, still a bit slow. So uh, I hope uh, you could facilitate and, uh, you know, uh, pr uh, provocative to, uh, you know, government, not only just government, but also private companies and u universities and etc. So please facilitate that kind of partnership. Thank so you. thank you so much, all the uh, speakers. Very great <laughs> contribution. And thank you very much for the audience. Very active you know, participation through uh, comments and the questions. Sorry, I couldn't take up all the questions, but uh, uh, thank you so much. Okay, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.